So let's take some questions. <laughs> Thank you. What a composition of lectures and thoughts and uh, proposals and propositions. And I would like to um, kind of uh, stick to Charlie what you t uh, said with the cosmopolitan apartheid, which I thought was really quite uh, a thing to say, which I think uh, is quite compelling. Um, that uh, I would like to uh, take on in relation to the question of class because this is something I have the feeling was present in all the presentations primarily also Helen in yours like the notion of class and what has happened to the class struggle in terms of being normalized, naturalized in terms of being kind of um, impregnated by the means of uh, politics of racialization, genderization pre-mediation, uh, sex sexualization. I mean, the, I think this all kind of uh, comes in and I would like to um, address this question, I mean, I think to Charlie, but to Helen, but I think also it might connect to uh, what, has, what is happening to the class struggle in all these kind of concerns, questions, primarily also Helen, with regard to this kind of uh, question, I mean, this is the cosmopolitan apartheid, the, the misfit, the dissolution, the transgression of the state. How do, you, how do you activate the notion of solidarity in that? I mean, uh, solidarity, uh, you connect it to this idea of distortion, to the collective temporal distortion. I just really want to understand, I mean, this kind of uh, beyond the nation state principle. I mean, what is the role of the state or is it like, uh, do we not care anymore? How does solidarity come into existence that copes with the kind of violence of transparency, the violence of multiculturalism that has been discussed in the 90s throughout the cultural studies that is reappears in the in the media I mean we had the rep reproduction and repetition of the white male middle class in the United States I mean this is highly racialized again so I mean this is like where the class struggle I think really needs to be on the table and I really I think this cosmopolitan apartheid I thought like is shotting through uh, the 20th century towards the 21st but uh, what do you think about this the state society principle in that context thanks Thank you, yeah, I mean, I think, is this, can you hear me? Yeah, I think it's a really important thing to, to foreground class struggle here, and I'm sorry if it wasn't sufficiently on the surface of what I was saying. I think it's sort of implicit in a lot of those arguments is the, the centrality of class and the necessity of thinking intersectionally doesn't exclude class at all. It just simply suggests that class is part of a nexus of other issues from which it can't really be disentangled, just as gender is part of a nexus of other issues from which it can't be disentangled, and race, and so on. You know, all of these factors are, are, are implicated in these discussions. And the, obviously, the, the subject who matters most is white, middle class, and male, and able-bodied and a child you know this is the, the the outcome of that kind of discussion that is that is the subject that the future addresses to some kind of extent and I mean you see there are some really particularly clear examples of that in terms of um, uh, uh, discussions around toxins for example so um, Mel Y Chen has this um, really interesting article about um, about toxicity and its role in queer sociality and one of the things that, um, that they pull up is this idea of um, toxic toys that circulated around sort of, uh, I think it's about sort of 2010, maybe slightly before, where there's this sudden real um, panic in the US about toys being imported to China that were um, uh, painted with sort of um, toxic lead paint, essentially. So the Chinese were going to be poisoning all of our children, was the kind of the suggestion. And this was... This was heavily, heavily obviously racialized in terms of the way ideas of contamination were circulating. It was heavily um, both classed and racialized in the fact that those anxieties and those, um, that worry about the circulation of toxin was not extended to the workers who produced those toys, like primarily female workers in Chinese factories who were obviously dealing with these, um, these pollutants, these contaminants, uh, a lot more frequently. So the, that circle of concern was not extended to those subjects. And then also the fact that um, in some of the sort of the reports, because it was sort of classy toys that turned out to be poisonous. It was a lot of expensive Thomas the Tank Engine, uh, sort of like luxury middle class products. 
that were supposed to be toxic. They were set off against what was assumed already to be a toxic kind of toy. So the, the free stuff that you get from McDonald's or the toy that you get in your Kinder Egg, all that sort of cheap and nasty stuff that poor people are supposed to play with, we already assume that that's toxic. And so there was a surprise mainly that these, sort of, these toys that were accessed by the middle class were shown to be painted by, in this way and so on and so forth. So that was a really interesting example, I think, of all of those, those things, how class and race and gender, because obviously Thomas the Tank Engine is a very masculinized kind of toy as well, all circulating around ideas of the toxic. So I think class is definitely a part of it. It's, I mean, it's fundamental to, to my politics. And so were you thinking that it, in terms of what I presented, it wasn't sufficiently brought to the surface or just you wanted an explicit comment? The reason I'm addressing the question of solidarity to you, I mean, mm. kind of, I mean, combined with Charlie's argument of so much attached to uh, a kind of a certain kind of movement that is localized, that takes place um, among like people of workers, uh, of trying to find, uh, I mean, um, uh, um, uh, kind of supporters or to align oneself in order to create a stronger argument. I mean, that's the question, uh, the, the question towards solidarity and towards class. I think to, uh, um, for Charlie. Well, I think I think um, in terms, I think basically what. I was hoping would one of the points of my um, talk would be that basically what's happened is that class struggle has been culturalized. So actually what is inequalities is so like economic in inequalities are being turned into cultural differences. I um, and I think you're right, somehow solidarity is is being created um, through cultural lines and identities rather than kind of economic lines. So I, I read this really interesting um, case study of Mexican laborers who were fighting for um, for um, econ like even um, for pay and for better pay but no one was interested in their struggle at all because it was just this tired same old problem of um, class difference and 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 what but then they um, basically changed their argument and they made it an um, issue of um, culture and as, and so they started to say that actually it was an inequality that was aimed at the native population and um, and then their uh, movement gained a huge amount of traction so the idea is that no one is interested in class struggle anymore. We've come to the kind of, we're, we're, we've got class fatigue and actually that, um, but we're interested in, cl in cultural struggles, in cultural issues, in cultural conflicts and this example of the Mexican movement was a perfect, perfect example of how as soon as they culturalized it became um, a, an issue, it, be, it became visible. But I also think even, I think your discussion of these um, TV programs of whether the, are they the ones that are making things acceptable? I mean, I, 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 I hate The Wire, for example, mm. because The Wire so much is about this culture of violence in the black community. So the culture and the community are all the things that are kind of masking or hiding the fact that ultimately there's a massive like um, economic issues um, that so somehow the, the effect of the history of slavery has kind of been pushed into a, a cultural thing and an attitude rather than um, the economic, the problems of economic realities. I think the wire, you can also read the wire as a big story about a crisis of masculinity in all layers of American society that as a side sideline. In terms of class struggle, um, there's, a, there's a science fiction film and the title doesn't come to my mind, maybe somebody in the audience recognizes it in which the ruling class takes off into space and leaves the working Elysium. class on what? Elysium. Probably Elysium. that. Elysium. Yes, yeah. yes, exactly, exactly. So there's a way in which a particular genre can represent the class struggle because it's not real like in science fiction. So that, that's one answer to it. The other one is that it really depends on your national cinema. So the representation of class struggle in British cinema is of course has a very long and very beautiful history and very potent history as well. And then another point on the point of cosmopolitan apartheid, I think that's a really, really wonderful term. And it also reminds me of the way we're looking back at Dutch pillarization in the 1950s, in which, which um, and, and that also was the root of South African apartheid in a way, in which the 
the pillars, the Roman Catholics, the Protestants, the Social Democrats, and the general pillar, society was organized vertically, and these groups wouldn't talk to each other. And everybody would sort of, the, the elites they talked to, rule, to sort of manage the country, but at the level of ordinary people, there was no contact. So I met my first Roman Catholic when I was 18. Right. And before that, we just didn't meet these people. I came from the red pillar, as we called it. And, uh, uh, and so uh, I, I went to a, a social democrat school. I went to a social democrat sports club. I uh, watched social democratic television. I listened to social democratic radio. And uh, there was no way in which we would have contact with each other. And that's in retrospect, talking about the Dutch tolerance, I was a bit struck by what you said, talking about the Dutch tolerance, in retrospect we def redefine that as indifference rather than tolerance because it was a way to separate these groups in society. And we've tried that with um, Islam as well, to turn Islam into a pillar with its own organization, and that failed as, on, as a part of multiculturalism as well. Yeah, so a lot of rambling on different issues. Um, it might also be rambling, but um, following up on your question, and to whomever feels uh, 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 welcome to answer. I'm just wondering in h how far you feel that uh, politics or like the body of politics, the political institutions have played a part in deflecting perhaps um, the class struggle to a cultural struggle. Charlie seems to have uh, located it also in a consumerist uh, fashion. Um, because on one hand, it, but I, this almost feels like putting out a conspiracy theory, but that um, uh, a class struggle seems something which you can at least strive to resolve. But as also taking from Charlie's talk, if you want to resolve cultural differences, should it all be alike? Do we you know, want to strive for a heterocultural society in which things are different from each other but still equal? That's almost, it's almost like an um, impossible uh, puzzle. So it could also be a kind of tool, this feels like a conspiracy theory, to deflect the class struggle to a cultural struggle, which is in itself maybe irresolvable, mm -hmm. in order not to have to deal with the class struggle situations. And so what part you feel politics uh, have played in that? I mean, this whole idea is that um, the idea of class struggle becoming cultural st struggle, it, exactly that. It's the, the idea that we're not looking for politics, for answers, that somehow the answers to all the problems are within ourselves, you know? And I think it's what you were saying about ecology is also, it's like we, we look, somehow the kind of issue of ecology has made, has become a personal issue where we have to recycle and we have to think about, you know, the world. And if we don't, then we, if we, we you know, taking flights, then it's our fault, you know, rather than looking. So it kind of, that sort of personal responsibility leads directly to guilt. And guilt kind of stops you from looking at what are the, what's the political structure that actually needs to change in order for improvements to be made. So to a certain extent, it's kind of this, like, make it individual responsibility. And, um, and so... Um, I think it's definitely true that to a certain extent politics allows us to kind of fight out these battles and it kind of it sells us guilt and you see that consumer culture sells us this guilt and it gives us also the answers with kind of um, ecological, ecologically sound inventions and ideas. Um, and then all these kind of real political decisions the real, are, are, are taken in secret and are kind of hidden and, and, and we, we know less about about how they really work, mm. what would you say? Yeah, I mean, I think this issue of individualization is an interesting one. I mean, um, I've heard it described in relation to um, sort of ecological activism as a kind of moral injury that takes place around anxieties about 
uh, climate change because we're being told all the time that it's down to us and ultimately we, we know on some level that you know we've been consuming the eco produce we've been doing this we've been doing that we know that it's not about us we know it's a systemic thing and that plays into some of the things you were talking about in your presentation as well around um, around the, the gendered body so this idea about um, about the veil and that being something a, a feminist gesture which of course it can be um, of course we need to think beyond that individualized level of who's wearing what and think about the, the systems in which that takes place so in what context is that a transgressive gesture or, or an assertion of um, agency and autonomy and in what context is it something that's coerced obviously it's not always one or always the other there is a kind of there are various dynamics at play and it's the same with the sexualized female body like that's not always a gesture of agency and empowerment it's very often um, the result of coercive social systems around desirability and uh, the body is erotic capital and all of this kind of stuff so I think uh, on some level it's a question of scale in terms of how you look at things that often there uh, we need to be prompting ourselves to kind of zoom out a level and then zoom out another level to think about the way that these things kind of integrate yeah. and very often what you what it comes down to is the systemic effects of capital you know that's always where you you end up and where I remember Douglas saying yesterday that Marxism becomes a very useful framework just because of the way it prompts you to think things on a different scale you know so I think it's always always worth going back to it um, I, I I was just talking to Shimon about um, the um, when I used to watch uh, read Adbusters, you know, and how how Adbusters was such a good magazine, and it was so, but it was really like when we were still outwardly political and I was saying how Adbusters has now been replaced by The Daily Show and that's not that's not really being political anymore that's just sort of being cynical about politics or kind of laughing it encourages it so Adbusters this incredibly sincere discussion of politics kind of turned into this ironic laughing at politics and but I think your example also of um, how in a way the future of the world is now it's t for we have to save our children so actually all the kind of political issues of um, of, of, uh, of the environmental like long-term environmental damage have been basically are back to us being bad parents you know so somehow it's all this kind of turning back and in, into ourselves and our guilt and that stops us from sort of blaming politics to a certain extent Um, I wanted to um, ask Helen uh, whether you were aware of the concept um, that was, I think, um, lately described in the Harvard Design Magazine. Uh, in um, I think the title is called Family, and um, the essay, um, which I, I cannot remember the name, it really doesn't matter, because the argument basically is in that essay that we will always force to be these sort of nuclear families by the economy or the nation state because the nation state is very much interested in having us as nuclear families not because because the queer family is the threat as such uh, but the queer couple so or the single and that is due to the fact that uh, a nuclear family is more interesting because of the service or the exchange of services which then generates money so the flow of money or another um, concept which is not so interesting as well is the extended family because also the extended family exchanges services but there is no cash flowing um, and I was wondering how do we connect these sort of notions then with um, what you were saying also how can we think of a feminist future beyond the family yeah, I mean, I'm very invested in destroying the family. You know, I'm strongly, strongly pro the destruction of the family. And um, which is, you know, it's largely, un yeah, it's largely unsayable because the family is seen to be everything that's good. And, to, you know, when we talk about sort of queer, queer families and queer familiality, like that becomes, you know, it's borrowing the same concept of, of the family, which I think is kind of, it's been sort of, this, I don't know, I don't think, I don't know how pro productive it is to, to try and rethink the family to to create more inclusive ideas of the family when I think it's something that's so 
problematic already. I mean, I think I've, uh, it, that's another really clear strand of my work is I'm really interested in how, uh, I call it domestic realism, not in terms of the like, literary genre, but in terms of um, Mark Fisher's idea of capitalist realism. So capitalist realism is what tells us that there is no alternative. There is only capitalism. There's nothing outside of capitalism. And it relates back to the, the Jameson quote um, taken up by Zizek, this, that it's easier to imagine apocalypse than it is the, the end of capitalism. So we can, you know, it's much easier to imagine the end of the world than the end of the system in which we currently circulate. And that, I think, also extends to the domestic sphere. So, and the way that we organise the household on a physical level and the way that we organise the household on a social level. I think even within a lot of feminist writing, that's now fallen by the wayside, this idea that we would try and rethink what it means to be a family, that we would rethink the way that we try and live, even though we sort of know that the family, as we understand it, is a historical construct that had to be actively built from the ground up, that suburbia had to be, had to be constructed as a way of undermining workers' solidarity to a larger, large extent. You know, it's a way of atomizing groups and getting them out of the city into a place where they have to commute to and from, and it encourages certain modes of being with each other and modes of being a family, and it privileges certain connections between people. So it privileges that between the uh, heterosexual couple and their children in a very sort of uh, protective kind of isolated way and undermines all of those different forms of family which can happen outside of the genetic line. So I think they're very... I think in refusing this idea of the future as being for our children, part of it is pointing to how can we make kin that... that Haraway slogan, make kin, not babies. A crucial part of making kin is rethinking what the family is. And, you know, it's a really unpopular idea because people just think, you know, 70s communes and, you know, that it'll all be awful. But I still have sufficient ambition, a uh, feminist ambition, that we can rethink the home, that it can be transformed. And there are so many interesting lost futures in terms of what the home could be, and feminist projects to reimagine the home that fell by the wayside, that I think it's really productive to look back to that little aperture of freedom where people were thinking it could be different than it is now and it could be better and the the workloads of social reproduction could be distributed in a way that don't unnecessarily burden women. You know, and then that creates, it, I don't know, it's so linked to rethinking kind of queer play and queer sociality, because once you remove that sort of, that strut of the family, a lot of other things start to loosen up as well. So, yeah, no, I'm, I'm with you. I agree, these are important things and very closely connected to what I'm trying to think through with this idea of, uh, of no future as it applies to eco-activism. Lisbeth, you had something to add or...? Last question. Thank you. Um, I am absolutely supportive of the idea that we shouldn't mistake class struggle with cultural struggle, and I think class struggle is a political issue that we should deal with um, rather than supposed cultural struggles. And I'm intrigued by how all of a sudden when the alternative family structures, queer structures, etc., come in, I'm like, oh, haven't we just gone down the cultural route again, cultural struggles, and haven't we missed the actual essence that it's not necessarily that interesting how you shape it, it's more like are you given the rights that you deserve as whichever structure you choose to live your life in. So I'm, I'm, I'm just observing that there's this tension between the two and I think we're all thinking in the same direction but it does show how the slippery slope of cultural or identity thinking which is not necessarily a political way forward. Uh, thank you. I mean I think yeah it's really important not to I, I, yeah, I think these need to be disentangled because the, f the family is absolutely crucial to class struggle. It's, it always has been. To separate the family out from class struggle is to ignore the reproductive labour that has historically been done by women that has been so necessary for capital. Like, the way capital works is by exploiting two workers with one wage, historically. You know, the, the home is a site of political ca anti-capitalist struggle. It has to be. The whole network has been built around it. So if you look at something like the way poverty is defined in the States right now, it's still, still defined in the United States on the basis of uh, a, a family which has a stay-at-home mother. 
who has this, these abilities to produce food and, uh, you know, and reduce economic costs within the household and so on. I think it is, is to introduce a false dichotomy to assume that there is the sphere of class struggle and the sphere of familial and gender struggles. The risk is that it falls into a classic Marxist trap of saying, oh, you're splitting the movement. You're splitting the movement. If, you, if you're trying to talk about, about gender, then you're splitting the movement. It's really about class. It isn't about one thing or the other. The crucial thing is to insert the class politics into the cultural struggle, not to ignore the cultural struggle. It's, the, the, it's part of an integrated thing. And it has to be said again and again and again because too often the things that get cast aside as being not important in terms of anti-capitalist struggle are, are crucial to it and you know so and it's the way that capitalism has worked has been to split the working class split women workers from male workers to pit them against each other you know if you look at the history of trade unions in the UK you see it again and again and again that by pitting a male worker against a female worker you can drive down the wage unilaterally so there has to be you know autonomous struggles within these groups, but they have to be part of a wider direction. And I think what you say about there being this sort of wider direction within the politics, that's the crucial thing to focus on. And we have to insist upon the fact that these struggles are, or, or can be, and should be anti-capitalist. When, when, re when, when you say you have to integrate the class struggle into the cultural struggle, you're posing a, prime, a, a primary state of the cultural struggle. Right, or am I, am I, per no, am I'm I continuing talking about, I'm the... talking about integration between different things. I mean, I think, I think if it comes down to it, for me, the class struggle is, is the one of, because it is so systemic, I think it is the overarching framework for mm. a lot of what we do. Mm. But what I'm saying is that they can't be disentangled because when we talk about gender and race and ability, a lot of the time we're talking about class already. It's just that it's... People seem to think because it's being, I'm not saying it, it always happens because things, these things can be de-emphasized as Charlie so accurately points out. You can find that the class drops off the radar a bit, but it, it's in there. It, I think as a collective political struggle, it has to be about this intersectional space and class is very often an overarching structure in which these intersectional battles play out, you know, so, but it never, it's not healthy to, to focus on to say that these discussions don't matter because they're not directly relevant to class, often they are relevant to class and it's the way that we're talking about them that is problematic. It, does that make sense? It, it, it does, yes, but I wonder... Yeah, I think, I, think I'm, I'm, I mean, and this is something that you point out, which is something that I've been interested in for a, a, a while as well, is this ethics of indifference, which also what you pointed out, this Dutch dream of the indifferent, you know, everyone living next to each other, which of course is also a very Protestant idea, like, you know, I close my door behind me and I'm free and I go on the street and, you know, hello, hello, you do what you do, I do what I do. Um, and I wonder how we can ever return to that dream. No, but, I'm not from the Netherlands, so I don't know if that actually ever existed, that dream of the perfect, indifferent, happy society in that sense. Um. It did, well, I'm not sure whether it was a dream of a happy society, but it, it went into history as the model of Dutch tolerance, look at all these different groups living peacefully together. And in retrospect, we have redefined that as basically as a model of indifference. And and uh, I'm not not. I mean, the 1950s in the Netherlands were not a happy time, um, and the 1960s broke up quite a lot of that. Um, so I don't know whether it, it did exist at a very practical level. It also existed at the level of. Uh, uh, political antagonisms. It also meant that class struggle in the Netherlands was never a big issue, not like it is in the UK. And uh, that means that political struggle in the Netherlands is, a, is also basically a very, very different thing. Also because we have a different political system with about 20 political parties that have to find a consensus with each other. And the UK was confronted with that for the first time with the last elections. A completely change of political culture you get. And the idea of what struggle means also becomes something different because it's many, many different factions against each other in changing coalitions. It's not one block against another and uh, so that, that makes it really very different um, but in retrospect it was it, I mean it is I like the way you framed it in your talk about 
a model of happy indifference is much, much better than a model of hard antagonism. So I would prefer that much more over uh, all kinds of debates and discussions and struggles, uh, which the, the, the vulnerable groups are bound to lose anyway. And uh, so, the, so I would go for indifference any time. Well, I, I definitely think like, the American election is a perfect example of too little indifference or just too much sure. emotion. Too much emotion, you know. So yeah. to say, so what you're now, when you culturalize arguments, you make them emotional, and then therefore they're no longer logical, and they're no longer, you know, mathematical, and you know, economic. Economic issues are basically ma mathematically provable, you know, whereas cultural issues aren't. Um, but I definitely think it's true, it's like, where's the line between, because of course there are these differences between men and women is like, you know, kind of uh, a, a, a good one. And then so how do you... How do you talk about differences without culturalizing, you know, because it's, I mean, even like with the family of course you know the problem with that women have at the moment is that um, as soon as they become mothers they like start to lose all the kind of equality that they gained through their like um, uh, college education and getting a job as soon as you have a kid your um, economic potential goes down drastically and it's economic potential really I mean that's the main issue and when you solve that issue then all the other issues of who takes care of children and how our kind of burdens and responsibilities kind of pass through society are kind of solved from that. Yes, I'm also wary of anything that uh, just asserts individual value in terms of economic potential as well. And I know that a lot of, there's a lot of moves towards rethinking uh, value economically as well. So the rise of economies of care and cultures of care and, and new ways of thinking about it. I'm skeptical about it because I think too often um, care work and reproductive labor is sort of excluded from the realm of effortful activity uh, because it's it's often seen as a naturally occurring sort of outcrop of the female personality so the gendered personality produces care as a sort of natural resource that can then just be exploited and i think it's really important to foreground the fact that social reproduction very often is work under capitalism and we have a system where where the, what tends to go on in the home and in child rearing is the production of labor you know it's the production of a future labor force that gets reproduced i think it's very hard to envisage it as anything but work within sort of the way it functions under a lot of capitalist systems um so, and I, yeah, so I think rethinking the role of economic potential in terms of self-worth is sort of really, obviously, really important, and it's quite crucial. And but I think a lot of it will continue to come from anti-capitalist feminist struggle. I think that's where a lot of the energy behind these things lie. And it's sort of interesting that I think there's a, there's a, there's a sort of a disconnect between a lot of the stuff I'm talking about here and a lot of the things I'm talking about in London, where there's been a real resurgence of sort of 70s materialist politics you know there's a lot of materialist feminism is back on the back on the agenda in a really serious way and you know the names that are coming up a lot are Fortunati and Federici and all of these sort of uh, Marxist feminists so there's been this sort of swerve I think within the London left towards a return to these these issues and the moment is a moment of synthesis, a synthesis of the sort of third wave feminist, queer politics, intersectional feminism, and the way that that has been taken up by some people as excluding class. And there's been this new reintegration. So, okay, they are not, they're not like oil and water. It's not that they, there's no way of really bringing them together. There can be a kind of um, political osmosis that, m that means that we can have an intersectional anti-capitalist politics. You know, and we sort, of, we sort of have to have one. Otherwise, there is no future that I would want to be a part of. But um, don't you think, to a certain extent, the resurgence of that kind of um, ideological thinking <laughs> that um, is also the fact that we our, our parents came from a kind of post ideological um, world where they were very scared of ideology 
And um, since we've been um, living in an ideal, a post-ideological world, we no longer have that fear of ideology. And so therefore, all the sort of warning signs and things, we don't see them anymore. We, we, we've gone back to thinking things are um, possible, solutions are possible, that ideological solutions are possible. I think it's really interesting to me that um, we um, now, the rights to Mein Kampf have been made public. And I, somehow I find it really connected to like the age of TED Talks, you know, because it's like suddenly everyone has a way of changing the world and changing the world is no longer thought of as dangerous. We have no cynicism. In fact, if you want to do any business idea, your business and get investment, it has to change the world. So that's a kind of, you know, total... Um, sort of like um, 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 thoughtless embrace of, of, of ideology that's happening now. But I think, I think there's always been... First of all, I don't necessarily think ideology is a bad thing. I think it depends what ideology we're talking about and to what uses we're putting it. Um, but I think there's... I think it's about widening access to the future because for a really long time there has been a discourse of the future but it's come from the right you know and it has been really linked to linked to the perpetuation of capitalism and the you know the advance of you know self-flying jets and, and you know the, so the future has belonged to capital for a really long time and it's it's I, I, you're completely right that it's been post ideological for um, a long time you know with the fall of the Soviet Union it seemed like thinking about a sort of counter hegemonic wide-scale restructuring of the world was too dangerous. But I think amongst the younger generation there's been a realisation that not thinking about a wide-scale restructuring of the world is already terribly dangerous because the world is already unbearable for so many people. Mm. You know, and for the, the, the global south, you know, for certain queer subjects, for uh, gender dissident subjects, life is unbearable, not to mention all the species that we're kind of eradicating. There has, I think, there is a real tension between... Um, melancholy and illusion, pol politically speaking. This idea that everything is fucked, so we might as well give up, versus everything will be okay, just look on the bright side, oh, we're not dead yet. There needs to be something in the middle that makes use of the enabling affect of hope, but does so in a critical manner. And that is the project that I think uh, we have to start building. Like, you know, I, I, and you've com you're right that it's risky, and we've, and we've seen from previous generations that it's risky, and probably there'll be somebody sitting here in 50 years' time talking about, you know, what crazy screw-ups we were. But, like, I think we... I think it's a bigger risk to pretend to risk nothing and just stay in a state of stasis. I think that we have to start mobilising those enabling affects of hope and trying to <laughs> reclaim a future that is more emancipatory than the one that has passed. I think it's an ethical responsibility. Ladies and gentlemen, Lisbeth van Zonen, Charlie Colas, and Helen Hester. Big applause. Really, really great conversation. Thank you so much, so much. Well, with this, we conclude our two-day Futurosity Summit. Thank you all for your attention. Thank you, Douglas Copeland, for the inspiration. Thank you to all of the Kunzblock colleagues for co-programming. And let's have a drink outside. See you soon. <laughs> <laughs>